What is up everyone? My name is Joseph and welcome to the very first episode of Casually Competitive Crafts where we take a commander, go through it, and explain how you can build around it. Think of it like a mini deck tech or like an introductory primer. In this video, we'll go over win cons for the commander, good archetypes and supporting cards to build around this commander, as well as go over some opening hands so you can get a feel for what the commander can do. The goal is that by the end of the video, you'll have all the information you need to start building your very own deck with this commander at a semi-competitive power level. Just so you know, before we get started, we will be leaving a link in the description to a mini primer or a deck list of just a handful of cards that we discussed today. So you can have the starting point in the form of a deck list, and we will also be linking a full deck list that we've used on the channel. So those will be in the description right next to a Patreon link if you want to help support the channel, a YouTube membership join button, a TCG affiliate link, and a Discord server link as well if any of those are interesting to you. That being said, let's just jump right into crafting a casually competitive Chulain Teller of Tales. Before we get started, I do want to clarify something. You may have heard me or other people pronounce this commander as Holland, and the reason for this is I believe it's based off of a foreign name, which would be pronounced Holland with a little inflection at the beginning. However, just for clarity, I will be using Chulain as this commander's name for the remainder of this video. So to start this craft off, let's talk about how you can use Chulain's ability to win the game. The main goal with this commander and what you're going to be trying to do throughout the game is get your board into a state where you can basically repeatedly and infinitely cast creatures with Chulain on the battlefield. This will allow you to draw your deck, but how can you get your board to be in this state? Well, let's talk about drawing your deck. There are a few different ways that Chulain can be used in order to accomplish this, and the most popular and what I have found to be the easiest is using Shrieking Drake and Mana Breach. With Mana Breach on the battlefield, every time you cast Shrieking Drake, you'll be bouncing an island to your hand, and then when you cast Shrieking Drake, you'll be putting this land back onto the battlefield with Chulain's ability and then drawing another card. When Shrieking Drake enters the battlefield, it will bounce itself, and this will allow you to recast Shrieking Drake as many times as you want, allowing you to essentially draw cards for zero mana. Now this won't net you any mana, however if you happen to hit a card like Lotus Cobra for example and you're able to cast it, every time you replay that land you'll be generating 1 mana, and that will get you enough mana to get started and get to winning the game once you have your library in your hand. So that's one way to draw your deck, but there are many more. Another common way is using Aluren and Cloudstone Curio. With these two on the battlefield, as well as your commander, you'll be able to cast and bounce two creatures that have CMC 3 or less in order to draw your deck for zero mana. Now this will net you mana because you will be able to put the lands onto the battlefield and Aloran allows you to not use any mana while you cast these creatures. So the end state of this loop is you will have all the lands that are left in your library onto the battlefield and you'll have the rest of your cards in your hands. A third way to draw your library using Chulain's ability is using Intruder Alarm and Cloud Stone Curio. This is similar to the Aloran method as you will be bouncing and replaying the same creatures, however this one requires a bit more setup. Since Intruder Alarm will untap all of your mana dorks every time you recast a creature, you need to make sure that you have enough mana in mana dorks in order to continually recast the creatures that you'll be bouncing between. This may not seem as ideal, however if you have 4 mana and mana dorks and 2 1 CMC creatures, you'll only have to pay 1 mana to recast a creature, bouncing the other one to your hand, and untapping 4 mana each time, generating a lot of mana, and drawing a card each time you cast a creature with Chulain. So the end state of this combo will be a lot of mana and your library in your hands with lands on the battlefield that were in your deck. Very similar to Aluren, just a little bit different of a setup. The final method that we're going to talk about that you can use to draw your deck is a little bit of a conglomerate of a bunch of different ways. This method boils down to just utilizing creatures that untap other creatures. So something like a village bell ringer enters the battlefield, untaps your mana dorks, and then you can use Chulain's ability to bounce village bell ringer to your hand, and then you use your mana dork mana to recast it. And if you can generate enough mana with your mana dorks, you can cast village bell ringer as many times as you want. This also works with something like a Wirewood Symbio in a Mirror Entity, as well as a Mana Dork that produces at least 2 mana when it's tapped. You can use Mirror Entity to turn Wirewood Symbiote into an Elf, 
use Wirewood Symbiote's ability to bounce itself, since it's now an elf, to untap your mana dork, and then retap your mana dork to generate enough mana to recast Wirewood and again turn it into an elf. So those four methods are what you're going to want to build around while working around Chulain. But now that you have your deck in your hand, what are you going to do to win the game? Well, this is really easy and you really don't have to devote too much into this. For starters, with your library in your hand, it's fairly simple to just generate massive amounts of mana using mana dorks, concordant crossroads, intruder alarm, as well as untapping creatures like village bell ringer, and even Aloran to play those creatures for free. It's very easy to generate infinite or as much mana as you need. But now that you have all this mana, what are you going to do with it? Well, a simple answer is Finale of Devastation X equals, well, as much as you can, and then going to combat and swinging out at your opponents. Another way would be to use Mirror Entity's ability to pump all your creatures as high as you can, and then swinging out. As a suggestion, I would lean more towards this combat focus route, because both of those win cons are going to be useful in other parts of the game, so they're not really dead cards if you draw them. A win con like Laboratory Maniac is kind of dead if you draw it in the mid game, and even though you are drawing your library easily and it would just be playing a creature to win, you don't need to. There are other ways to win using shoe lane that don't involve having dead cards in your deck like a Laboratory Maniac or a Thassa's Oracle, so I would suggest forming your win cons around the Finale of Devastation route because those cards are just going to be useful at all points in the game. So now that we've gone over the cards that you need to build around in order to efficiently win with Chulain, let's talk about some good supporting cards that you can slot in that aren't directly tied to winning the game, but are cards that just synergize really well and help you get to that win faster and more safely. So the first category of cards I want to talk about are Soft Stacks and Hate Bear type effect, specifically non-creature hate and artifact hate. Since a lot of your win pieces are creature based, and since a lot of your ramp is, again, creature based, hating out artifacts using something like an Aura of Silence or a Null Rod, or even better, a Collector Oof or a Kataki Wars Mage, are really good to slow down your opponents. The creature-based hate pieces are even better because they can trigger Chulain, generating you more card draw and ramp and just more value overall. In terms of non-creature hate, cards that are really good that synergize well with your deck are cards like Deafening Silence, Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, and Lavinia, Azorius Renegade. Your deck should be built in a way that these don't really affect you and you could easily win through any of them, and these being on the battlefield will not only slow down your opponents, but if they're not playing a creature-based win con, will basically stop them from winning unless they can deal with it. Another good group of cards to add into this deck are general control pieces. You're in three really good control colors with blue, green, and white, and you should really take advantage of that. In addition to the colors, a lot of what your deck will be doing will be low CMC creatures, so it's not unlikely that you'll have a good amount of mana to hold up for instant speed interaction. In terms of what interaction is good to hold up, I would suggest a good amount of counter spells, a good amount of green artifact and enchantment removal pieces, some white single target creature removal, as well as some protection to make sure your spells resolve. These will all do a lot to slow down your opponents as well as protect your own board and help you get where you need to go a little bit more safely. A good thing to keep in mind that with these control pieces, while you do want to be stopping your opponent's wins, you also want to stop pieces that directly affect your board state and what you want to do. So permanents like Cursed Totem or Linvala Keeper of Silence or just Clasm effects that really shut down small creature decks or activated abilities of creatures, you want to make sure that your control package is built in a way to stop these from happening as much as possible. Another group of hate pieces that you want to be aware of are things that stop ETB effects from happening, so like a Torpor Orb or a Hushbringer, because although Chulane triggers on creature cast, so you still will draw cards and put lands onto the battlefield, even if a Torpor Orb is in effect, you won't be able to win as easily as a lot of the ways that you draw your library is reliant on creature ETB effects, so that's another area to watch out for. That all being said, a good control package can keep you safe and keep you consistent as as you continue to play and optimize this deck. So now that we've gone over how to win, how to build and add in good supporting cards, let's take a look at some example starting hands that I took from the deck list into the description. We're going to go over a bad starting hand when you should mulligan, a good one that you should probably keep on maybe a second 7 or a 6, and one that is usually an insta-keep for a 7. So to start off, let's look at a bad opening hand. 
So the opening hand you see on screen has four lands, a single counter spell, an artifact hate spell, and a tutor. While this may look like an okay or safe hand, this really does not have a lot going for it. You don't have any ramp or acceleration, and although you'd have a tutor for a creature-based win con, it's not going to get you very far if you're playing spells on curve. If you're playing a turn 5 Chu lane, it's not going to get you very far, and with only one counter that only hits non-creatures and an artifact hate piece that isn't the strongest in the deck, you're not going to be slowing down your opponents too much, and you're really going to be putting yourself behind. If you keep this hand, you'd find yourself really hoping that the top card of your library is good, and if it's not, you're going to be really far behind of your opponents, so because of that, this is a hand you should probably mulligan. This is only really keepable if you're down to maybe 5 and you bottom 2 lands, but other than that, you really don't want to keep this for a 7 or a 6. The next hand we have here is one I would consider good or one to keep on a second 7 or maybe a 6, and it's a risky keep as a first 7. On the surface, it may look really good with a turn 1 soul ring, however, the closer you look in, the more you realize that this doesn't really have a lot going for it and can be disturbed very easily. Sure, you can drop a Birds of Paradise, an Avacyn's Pilgrim, and a Soul Ring very quickly to get all your colors. However, you only have one land, and you have no way to stop anyone from either mental misstepping something, or from a Pyroclasm type effect setting you way back, or an Artifact Destruction spell, again setting you back. And you do have some nice pieces to get you to your win con quickly, but since you have no real way to protect yourself other than the silence, this hand can be very easily disturbed and should only be kept if you know what your opponents are playing. If they're not playing a lot of creature removal and you think you can safely get what you need out and maintain a board state by turn 3, this is a very good hand. If you expect them to be running wipes, clears, or any type of counter spells that will be directed at you, you may want to think twice about keeping this one lander. Now this next hand is fairly similar, however this is one I would suggest keeping on a first or a second 7. It has two lands with a lot of mana accelerants with the Finthorn Elves and the Faber Elder, as well as a really good hate piece to slow down your opponents in Deafening Silence, and a direct path to victory with the Whirly Tutor and the Mana Breach. So, it is similar to the last hand as it has win cards in hand, however this one is much more reliable with mana accelerants, and that Deafening Silence can almost be used as a control piece since your opponents won't be able to ramp out as quickly and you'll be able to establish more of a board state before they can stop it or control it. So overall, I would say this is a very good hand to keep, depending on your opponents, but this one's going to be a very safe hand. Now with three opening hands out of the way, that does wrap up this video. Let us know what you thought of this style of short form, really introductory, maybe a mini primer, I guess you could call it, for this commander, and if it's something you'd like to see in the future. Like I said at the beginning, the goal of these videos is to just give you the pieces and general information you need in order to go off on your own and start building on your own, so let us know if that's helpful for you, and we will continue to do this if there is a want for it. That all being said, that is all we have for this episode. All the links for everything we talked about is in the description, so go ahead and check that out if you want to continue to build this commander. But for now, I am Joseph, this is Casually Competitive MTG, and we will see you next time.